All right, folks, thank you so much for joining us for today's webcast. Employers must play their part in the fight against obesity, sponsored by Diabetes Leadership Council. This webcast has been pre-approved for one HRCI credit and one SHRM credit, so please be sure to attend the complete webcast in order to receive your credit. You will receive an email from hr.com within two business days, and it will include your certification information. So during the webcast, we have the chat open for engagement. You would choose everyone from the drop-down box in the chat, and then everyone can engage together. And then if you have questions for the presenters, we ask that you use the Q&A in your webinar controls, place your questions there. All right, I think that's all the logistics on my end. Now it is the good part. It is my pleasure to turn it over to you, George Huntley, to get us started. Thank you, Rhonda. And uh, good, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending upon where you are. Um, uh, my name is George Huntley. I'm the moderator today. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Diabetes Leadership Council, a patient living with type 1 diabetes for over 40 years. But uh, most germane to this audience, in my other career and day job, I've been the chief financial officer of a professional services firm and a manufacturing company, and I've been the plan administrator of an employer-based health plan for over 25 years. So that's what that lens is bringing us to today's conversation on obesity. Uh, some quick disclosures. This program is sponsored by Eli Lilly and Company. Um, all of our presenters today are receiving an honorarium for their participation. And in addition, uh, Dr. Miller is also provides her technical expertise uh, on advisory board and speaking uh, bureau for Eli Lilly and Company. So with that, uh, briefly, the Diabetes Leadership Council, we are a 501c3 nonprofit advocacy organization providing policy expertise to lawmakers and advocates and um, other influencers, including self-insured employers uh, and, and the brokers that help influence them. All of the board members of the DLC are past leaders of a national diabetes organization. We have, between the board, we have centuries of experience in the world of diabetes and delighted to bring this uh, conversation today. Uh, what we're going to talk about here is the state of diabetes and obesity in the United States. It's the driver, probably the number one driver of type 2 diabetes, which is why we're involved in this. We're going to talk about the complex and chronic disease that is obesity uh, and the stigma, bias, and discrimination that go along with obesity in today's environment and talk about how that impacts things and, and how that impacts your company and how your company and some of the HR practices that you should be mindful of as we go forward. So with that, it's a packed agenda. As you say, please put your uh, questions in the Q&A, uh, but I'd like to start us off with the state of obesity and invite uh, Dr. Allison Sexton Ward. Uh, she is a research scientist at the University of Southern California Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics. She's an economist with extensive experience on healthcare policy and pharmaceuticals. And she's also a co-author on a paper released last year called Benefits of Medicare Coverage for Weight Loss Drugs, which we will definitely discuss a bit today. Uh, Dr. Ward, thank you. Thanks for having me, George. Fight against obesity in this country, where do we stand today? Yeah, so um, we're losing that fight, as you were saying. And as you see on the slide in front of you, we're graphing the um, average BMI in America from the 90s and projecting it through 2050. And so this is sort of status quo. If we don't change our policies, what's going to happen? And you see right at that point where um, average BMI is hitting 30, which is the threshold for obesity. So although obesity rates are only at about 40%, this gives you an idea of the distribution such that it's leading to the average BMI across adults to be um, at that BMI threshold of 30. Yeah, it's and and you know forty percent is still pretty high, but getting to fifty Absolutely. and more, the trajectory is 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 the thing we have to worry about in in, in getting this down. So it's it's a public health crisis. We know this. It's it's depressing. Um, talk to us about what this really means. Yeah, I think a lot of us have heard those statistics around the rates of obesity, but what's potentially more salient is thinking about it in terms of um, obesity being second only to smoking in terms of a leading cause of preventable death in the U.S. And with that, nearly um, 
one in five African Americans and Caucasians age 40 to 85, the deaths in those populations is attributable to obesity. Um, so that puts sort of the danger and 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 the um, risks into a different context. But I think what's really important to think about is that these rates and these statistics are all part of um, the status quo policies. And that's not nothing. We have been fighting obesity for decades. We have decades of public health efforts to call attention to obesity rates and, and lifestyle interventions. And these things aren't working. They're what underlie that first chart that shows the rates climbing into the future. So we're at a point where we need to do more. And it, it starts with covering some of the new therapies coming to market. So Medicare doesn't cur currently cover them. And um, similarly, many private insurance plans don't cover those drugs. And so therefore, Americans aren't taking them. Yeah, we're, we're going to talk a bit about that today. Um, and I know there's even more to this from a stat perspective. Yes. And this slide has many statistics on it. I think the clear takeaway is that um, obesity is associated with a lot of health issues. And so first and foremost, it shortens one's life. And the, the earlier in your life that um, obesity becomes a struggle, the more impact it has on your longevity. So um, if you are young, you can lose um, over a decade of life. It's also associated with higher medical costs. And so there's estimates that it's over for the U.S. population in general, it's over $260 billion a year. Or for the average American with obesity, their costs are 50% higher than their um, counter, their non-obese counterparts. So a lot of those higher costs are due to the fact that obesity is uh, linked with many other chronic, costly, and um, uh, quality of life di diminishing medical conditions, including diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, cancer, stroke, and many, many more. And I think what's the hardest part to uh, estimate is the impact that it has on the workforce, right? So we know that obesity causes absenteeism. It impacts how um, productive you are even when you're at work. And those estimates are really hard to quantify, but there has been some work to suggest that we're about three days per year additional absenteeism due to obesity. And I think as, as employers watching this, uh, that, that number is likely low. Um, you know, as we as we go on, but uh, we're starting to, you know, what gets measured gets managed, and we're starting to get get into this. Um, so this map is really sobering as to where where is the obesity concentration happening. Um, I don't know if your your comments on on as looking at how it, it you know this is not the political map where everything is red and blue, but uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so. Um, as the colors on the map get darker, the rates of obesity in those states increase. And so you can sort of see that that sort of southern block of states, we have the highest rates of obesity at 40% or higher. But I think what's also important to note is even if we're in a state that's yellow, such as myself, those rates are still 25% or higher. That's still much higher than obesity rates used to be, and those rates are climbing. So it's not just a Southern state issue. It's really impacting the entire U.S. Yeah, that's a great point. And, I, and if, if I had put this same slide up with diabetes, it would look the same. The, the concentrations of type two diabetes are exactly where you're seeing the, the concentration of obesity. So the two go hand in hand, hand in glove, uh, which is unfortunate, but it's a reality. So let's talk to us about, you know, the age group and when, when people are developing and what that, what all, that all means. Yeah. I think this is also one of the other stunning statistics behind the obesity, uh, uh, epidemic as we look at it, especially compared to 10 or 20 years ago, is that younger and younger populations are getting, is where the, the growth is really coming in. So we see here that it is a working age population issue. And we see that um, the, 
the rates within the 25 through uh, 50 year olds is where the concentration of the highest rates of obesity are. And it's very natural that once we sort of hit that retirement age, we're losing weight across the population anyway. So we need to tackle this in the younger populations. Yeah, I think, you know, also you don't see a lot of uh, uh, it, it's the, the when by the time you get to your 80s, the people with obesity probably aren't there. Uh, and so you see a natural drop off there. But the, to the to this audience, the reason we're having this conversation is it's the working age Americans who are dealing with this obesity disease, this crisis. And and if employers are not involved in this discussion, uh, we're not going to get anywhere because it, it's it's your workforce. It's the people on your employee roster that uh, that are deal dealing with this. And I think everybody on the on the call here knows that. Um and then to make it worse, it hits minority populations even harder. So it's not it's uh, it's it's disproportionate. So share a little bit of that news. Yes. And so we see here we have um, the obesity rates by race and ethnicity. And so uh, blacks are in red. Hispanics are in the purple bars and the and the white population is in the gray bars. And you can see in those second set of bars really that that's the total obesity rate within those populations. So there's a great um, difference between those groups with the uh, black rate of obesity being at nearly 60% and it's nearly 50% for the Hispanics and 50 for the white population. And as stunning as that statistic is, I think what's even scarier is that as you look at the breakdown further to the right on the slide, the big dis the the big differentiation between those groups isn't necessarily in that first 30 to 34 BMI range. It's in the more severe obese categories that are associated with more and more comorbid conditions. Yeah, and that's and that is something that we have to again, health equity being an important aspect of of if we're going to solve a societal problem, if we're going to solve an issue like obesity and diabetes. Um, you know, you have we have got to look at social determinants of health. We've got to look at some of the things we we can see that those populations are hit harder. Uh, we have got to go out of our way to figure out how to reach the, those populations. So this is a an important uh, you know important graph, if you will. Um, but you know, treating it. So let's go to some good news because your paper, uh, you guys studied what would be the impact if we actually treated obesity. So share with us a little bit of of, of sunshine, if you will, on this. Yes. And, and to tie in what you said on the previous slide too, I think there's research that has shown um, that uh, especially African-American populations are less likely to respond to some of the be intensive behavioral therapies that are most likely covered by insurers and that the simplification of treatment regimen, such as taking a therapy versus having an intervention, a uh, lifestyle intervention, reduces these health disparities because it makes it easier to, to sort of get the weight loss component of it. So, so I think that as we have greater access for the therapies that are being approved today, we will start to shrink some of those disparities we saw on the other slide. What we did at Schaefer Center is we looked at what would happen if um, everybody who was eligible given their um, BMI and their comorbid conditions eligible for uh, weight loss therapy was given access and took them. And so it's a little bit, um, uh, we're, 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 this is not necessarily what's going to happen tomorrow, but what would ha what's the total pie in terms of the value of treating obesity? So in that way, we're aspirational in our, in our modeling, but we looked 10 and 20 years into the future, what would happen to the rates of some of these comorbid conditions if we treated obesity with the drugs available today? So we looked at two different insurance coverage scenarios. One, what if Medicare covered them alone? And this ties into some of the legislation in Congress for Medicare being allowed to cover the drugs? And two, what if private insurance followed their lead and also covered the drugs? So we have the Medicare results there in the sort of um, lightest bar and red bars. And then in, in the um, darker gray and the purple bars, we see the, the results for Medicare and private insurance, both treating, ob covering obesity medications. And what you see is these positive 
uh, these bars are showing you the reduction in the rates of these um, diseases 10 and 20 years into the future. So if we look at diabetes in particular, you can see that if Medicare covers these drugs in 20 years, we would see a 7% drop in the rate of diabetes. But um, certainly the treating patients earlier in their lifespan and preventing the um, development of diabetes or any of these other chronic conditions is where the real value is at. So the private insurance also covering the therapies, we see that drop could be 17% um, or greater. And to just sort of give you some perspective on that, that would mean that in 20 years, 4.4 million fewer people would have diabetes if everybody eligible for these drugs took them. And that's equivalent to 45 million people years. So year people living with a year of diabetes um, lower in 20 years if we um, effectively treated obesity. Yeah. And as, a, as an advocate for diabetes for decades so far, this is the first time I've seen any hope in lowering that type two diabetes trajectory. Uh, and, but it makes logical sense that it's got to, we've got to intervene while they are, you know, while the disease is developing and not waiting till they're 65 to mir miraculously give them a, it's great to do it then, but we need to be doing it now. So, well, I, I really appreciate your adding this insight and providing this today, uh, Dr. Ward, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing this. And, uh, um, we're going to, that's nice, sets up a stage to talk about the medical side of this disease and, and what we're going to get into. So the next couple of pieces of this, we'll be doing that. And, and Dr. Miller, give me one second as we go into this and thank you, Dr. Ward, we're going to go into a quick polling question, um, on this as I get in, do you know the percentage of your employees with obesity? So I want to ask the audience this because, you know, what gets measured gets managed. And I've, again, I've run health plans. Um, we, you know, we, we, we measure how many people have diabetes. I know how the percentage of my participants that have that. Um, and I can handle and work with, with interventions on there to make sure that we're managing it. But uh, do you actually even know uh, the rate of obesity within your company? So let's see what, uh, uh, I'll let Rhonda, you know, use your judgment on when to push that forward because you're seeing that. Um, that aspect, but uh, no, yes, no, not sure. Some of you may not know uh, what you're tracking. Um, hopefully by the time you're done this conversation, it's something you put on your radar. Um, okay, so the answer was 4% new. So that's a pretty low number. 79% no, they don't know. And 16% wasn't sure. Um, so that's that's telling that it's something we're not managing today. So I appreciate your answering that and participating in this part of the dialogue. Um, and, um, you know, we're going to continue the dialogue. You know, we talked about it drives 2.7 times higher healthcare spending. Uh, and this is, I think, really telling information. This came from the Kaiser Family Foundation. Uh, you know, what is obesity costing, costing us? $12,588 for enrollees with an obesity diagnosis versus 4,699 for those without an obesity diagnosis. So obesity, in case we're not, in case you're not aware, obesity is expensive. I know diabetes is expensive. Diabetes itself is over 12 grand. Obesity is also very expensive. Uh, so we need to be aware of that. And the cost of obesity per worker, if you think of that medical differential of 7,089, that was from that last piece, um, we have presenteeism costs, we have absenteeism costs, you've got disability costs. The cost of obesity per worker today is nearly 13 grand. That's a big number. That's a big number. That's a number that should get your attention for working the problem of an ROI on this and working the problem of how do we how do we lower this, uh, this cost and this trajectory. So with that set up, and I will invite uh, we're going to move to a, a, a piece uh, on the, the, the science of this, and I'm going to invite Dr. Miller to join us, and thank you very much. Dr. Eden Miller is an osteopathic board-certified family practitioner. She is certified in obesity management is this, and is also the CEO of Diabetes and Obesity Care, LLC, in beautiful Bend, Oregon. And, and Dr. Miller, thank you for being here today. Um, so let's talk about, you know, we know obesity is a disease 
talk what's going on with it talk to share with the audience what what's 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 the science behind this yeah thanks so much george and you know i've been monitoring the cat the chat and question and answer and i think this is a really good tee up uh you know a lot of our participants are talking about the impact of dietary and its effect on what we call diabetes in this this epidemic and i'm here to tell you kind of the first myth that i want to bust is this uh, food is not the singularity of problem. Uh, the effect of diabetes is a multifaceted approach. Uh, after all, we are famine-proof individuals. It is not just diet alone. Yes, there is a lot of issues regarding food additives and gums and, and gut biome and, and types of food and process and access to food. But if we improved access to these healthier, you know, of the earth-based foods, we are not going to remove diabetes. Uh, in addition, I just want to call that that, yes, lifestyle is always going to be foundation and fundamental in treatment and prevention. But understand, we have 98 million people with early or prediabetes, and we have 40 million people in the United States with diabetes. And when you get a diagnosis of diabetes, George, when an individual with type 2 comes to my office, first day, A1C, 6.5 and above, do you know how much pancreas is gone? 50 to 70 percent. And so you're right, the early identification and treatment is imperative, but medications are the tools to do that. And we would not be free of diabetes if we just had better food and movement. We would have lessening of that. And that starts with this awareness and this getting back to our foundational of that our body tries to defend that highest weight at any time because we are famine proof. The obesity gene is not a bad gene, it's a bad century. And there are many components related to it. And we have the people who are at risk to get diabetes and secondary obesity. We have the people who have it currently, and we have the people with metastatic disease. And you just don't take somebody with advanced or diabetes and just say, you know what, it's just diet and exercise. That's all you need to do. It's not that simple. So, you know, it's a metabolic condition that's happening behind the scenes and i want to underscore that set point because what i you know from our dialogues a a person living with obesity a person as you know your body is defending the highest weight that it gets correct right because we're famine proof I mean, right? We are. We are. We want to have be an organism that defends it against famine. If you were to design the ideal organism during times of lean and illness and pregnancy and work and those kind of things, you're going to defend that. So I often tell my participants, you actually have a very good gene. It's just not adaptive to our environment. We have an obesogenic environment. I'm never going to disagree with you. However, understand that this is actually a very good adaptation of the body. It's just when it's in play, when we don't move and we don't experience famine. I'm not saying we all go and have a famine, but you get the gist. This is this is a chronic disease that is not just saying you guys need to work out more and you need to eat less, right? Imagine me wearing glasses as if I said, you know, George, you and I wear glasses. We just need to eat better and work out more. That's why we wear glasses. No, it's a chronic disease that we need to identify early, intervene early on multiple levels because if we don't, it's going to have its way with us as a population. Yeah, and it's it's progressive. Like diabetes is progressive, obesity is as well. So, you know, talk to us about the, you know, the classes that we see here. Yeah. So we currently do metrics related to height to weight ratio. That's what called BMI is its height to weight and metric. Uh, it's not the greatest of measurements. In fact, if we apply this to those who are of African-American descent or, or heritage, that BMI tends to kind of break away. You know, if we were to put this on some of those Olympic athletes, we would say, oh my gosh, they're obese. So it is impacted by muscle mass, but we have to measure something somewhere. And this is where we classify it. We look at it as stages of, of underweight or mild thinness or leanness, normal, overweight, and we call it class one, class two, and class three obesity. We really want to get away from using that terminology of an obese individual. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in that shame and blame. Yeah, that's perfect. That's perfect. So obesity is linked to 200 medical conditions, uh, and obviously <laughs> diabetes is one of them and is very expensive. Talk to us a little bit about this. 
You know, when we look at the core causes of disease, we are finding that excess adiposity or obesity. That's what I like to talk about it because you could look at an individual who does not really seem to have a high, you know, height to weight ratio, especially of that of the Asian culture, where they're leading the way in new cases of diabetes related conditions. And all of these chronic medical conditions are what we call peripheral or secondary results of excess adiposity. And so many of us who are experts in this field, we know that if we treat the core defect, we're going to be successful in both the present, the, the, the development of these conditions and the progress of these conditions. So that's why many of us in our standards of care, as I work with the ADA, uh, I liaison with the American Heart Association, we're really trying to find the core defect. If you affect the core defect, if you impact the core defect through mind, body, spirit, as therapies, different kinds of things, then you're going to have this trickle down effect that will virtually reach all disease states and will have a massive economic impact and prevention as we already heard from Dr. Ruth Sexton Ward. And so now we have the conversation of it is good news that you can impact it. Modest weight loss is, be is, is beneficial. You don't have to lose your whole, you know, get back to high school weight. What's your, you know, talk to us about that, you know, why this is so important. I love this slide. I love this slide because even in my presentation, just before this, I did a presentation for my colleagues across the United States and lifestyle and, and what we call weight reduction or excess adiposity. Many times I say to my colleagues, you know, what percentage of weight loss do you need for an individual? They'll say these astronomical numbers like, oh, they have to get back to their weight, like you said, in high school or, or lose 100 pounds. The answer is no. Uh, so many times when I, I work in my clinic as it's a specialty in metabolism and, and excess out of paucity, I talk to them, I say, do you know what first target we have for you? First of all, I ask them what they would like. And oftentimes it's unrealistic. You know, I want to look like I did in high school. Oh my gosh, you would look terrible. You're an adult. You would look like you have a terrible illness. And I tell them, you know, our first goal, a first goal is three to 5%. When we look at lifestyle intervention, or we look at medications, they're considered successful if we have three to 5%. And you can see on this slide what we get benefits from. So just mild weight loss has secondary benefits. Our first target is 10%. 10% is that first meaningful target that if there's an individual with 300 pounds, that's losing 30 pounds. And I often say to them, you think you could do that? And they go, I think I can. And so imagine how we get that encouragement and we get that focus even to prescribers and clinicians who are often unaware of the target. And then honestly, the holy grail is 15. 15% body weight just reduces mortality and morbidity and cancer. Then when you go beyond that, because some of my clients go beyond that, you end up looking better in a swimsuit, your joints are better, but understand there is meaningful reduction, meaningful progress, and all persons could accomplish one of these types of metrics to promote and improve their overall health. And I think the takeaway for the this audience, again, as an employer, uh, helping your people that are dealing with obesity lose 10 to 15% of their body weight, again, not their, you know, not get back to get, can have tangible medical benefits. And those tangible medical benefits will save you money. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the piece. And not, not in, in addition to improving the quality of life of, the, of, of your, of your employee and their family, uh, it will save you money in your health plan, which is uh, also on everybody's mind. So, you know, but it's not well treated. It's vastly undertreated today. So share a little bit about what's going on here. You know, one of the things I'm doing in my area of education and my colleagues in healthcare is I'm telling them very top of line, mention it to your clients, to your patients, to those you interface with. A lot of times we're fearful of mentioning it. We're fear of shame and blame, but I usually, it's a vital sign. George, just like blood pressure and heart rate and all the other things we do. And I often breach the subject, unless you're coming to me specifically for it. I say, you know, do you feel that you're the healthiest weight that you can be? Is that something you've thought about? Does it burden you? Is that something you would like to talk about? Something you would like to have a meaningful impact? That's the first thing. Bring it up. In addition, once you do bring that or open the door, do they actually take the next step? My last lecture, as I mentioned just briefly, was a prescription, a prescription for lifestyle, not just 
do better with exercise and eat less. Oh, that is nothing. That's more just a statement or a tagline. It doesn't give them that counseling. They don't have the diagnosis of obesity on their chart. That's important with payers, with demographics, with like the data that Dr. Sexton Ward talked to us about, that these individuals are getting this diagnosis and then a meaningful impact, a meaningful prescription for health. It doesn't have to be one and done. It's a marathon. It's a small, changeable thing of an individual in front of you. Let me give you a one statistic. Do you know that if a person who sits hour by hour, right? If every hour they get up for five minutes, they'll reduce their morbidity and mortality by 11%. Guess what? Everybody on this call, everybody here could do that. And you want to make sure that they're tangible. I'm not interested in having people become marathon runners. I'm interested in better movement, better nutrition for a better health, through a lifestyle for the rest of their life. And I think there's a there's a question here I just want to bring up because every employer out there can encourage people to move five minutes an hour. Everybody can do that. And that's something yep. that you can do within your corporate culture. And it doesn't have to be in the context of weight loss. It can be no. in the context of better improved health. Uh, and yeah, we'll talk we're going to get to stigma yeah, conversation very exactly. shortly. But uh, that's something everybody can be doing, and hopefully we get some takeaways. I'm going to I'm going to move quickly. Talked a little bit about the doctor's role. Let's talk about the treatments if we can. Yeah, we talked about lifestyle being foundational, a prescription, data actionable. Now I'm going to tell you those treatments, especially with GLP ones. Why are we talking about them? They're biological. Honestly, guys, they're not drugs. They're biological. Everybody on this call makes GLP-1, GIP, all those things. And many of these are 15 and 20% reduction, reduction in heart disease, kidney problems, where they're coming out for sleep apnea, sleep apnea, cancer reduction through reduction of fatty liver. And in those individuals that have tried for six months or more to improve their weight through lifestyle and medication intervention, they're still not at goal. They have a BMI of 30 and above with these comorbidities because they really have a reduction in their lifestyle. You're going to refer them for bariatric intervention because that's what it takes to break that hormonal conspiracy against the person's metabolism. Yeah, it's really important. And, and, and again, as employers, again, on this call, most of you, many of you, but I will say most are covering the bariatric surgery when it gets to an extreme case. Correct. But yep. what we're not doing as employers is covering lifestyle management and anti-obesity medications. And I would urge you, as you think about lifestyle management and nutritional counseling, and all of this, as you know, goes hand in hand, right? If You right. need to be covering all of it. Nutritional counseling and behavioral therapy, I believe everybody on this call will agree, is cheap. It's the yes. cheapest treatment that you can possibly cover. It's a lot cheaper than everything else on this list. And you go back and look, you're not covering it. And if you are covering it, you are likely following Medicare's rule that says it can only be administered in a primary care setting. That's not helpful. Primary care doctors do not have a nutritional they counselor. They don't have time. Yeah. They don't have time. They can't do it themselves. You've got to just cover this. You'll give away smoking cessation classes a thousand times because you know that we want that you want that employee to stop smoking. Uh, you, we need to be looking seriously at what you're what you're covering in these in these in your plan for this counseling, intensive behavioral therapy, and the GLP ones and these these anti obesity medications. They work. There is an ROI there. We've covered what it's costing you that you didn't know. Um, now we can talk about you know why you know what 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 can what good can be done from that. So I, I really appreciate this, and you know bariatric surgery works. That's the mm -hmm. beauty of it. It does work. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of this. And um, as we go into this, and I'm looking to see, uh, we've got some questions here. I, I, I before you before I let you go, Dr. Miller, we have in the chat are GLP ones. Hormone replacement therapies for a lifetime. What happens if they stop the therapy? Does all the weight come back? Please, please. That, please. That's that's an awesome question, and I'm going to use analogy. When you take off your glasses, do you have trouble seeing? You got to wear them when you want to see. Let's talk about statins, cholesterol medications, which are both primary and secondary preventative, right? For heart disease, primary if you have elevated risk, secondary if you've had an event. But what happens, George, when you stop taking your statins, your cholesterol goes back up. 
your risk goes back up. There is a time that we can get to a target, lower a dose and put them on a maintenance dose. What about diabetes? You intervene, you give them medications, you give them insulin, you get to a target, do you get to stop everything? Nothing, hardly anything in medicine has a legacy effect. And that kind of goes to that lack of knowledge that diabetes and obesity is a chronic disease. Yeah, we can lower the doses. Yeah, we can incorporate lifestyle to mitigate it. But remember, it's still a disease. And so in many cases, it can be for a lifetime or at least a time. Because as you saw, as we get older, 70s, 80s, 90s, we tend to lower our weight and we may not have that big of a risk. But it's a disease just like anything else. Yeah. And that's that's the, the bottom line here is this is a disease. It's not the patient's fault. There is something physiologically going on within the body, within the metabolic process. And there are too many people on your employees in this society that are dealing with this for all of us to be the, it, their fault. This is, mm -hmm. this, we've got to, we've got to smack our, you know, our, our silly on this and wake up and engage in finding the solution. There was a question in here on, on, from an insurance perspective, Hey, I, 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 can't customize this. You must be in a fully insured plan. Because if you're in a self-insured plan, you absolutely can customize things. They'll do it. If you, so, if you are in a self-insured plan and you're working with any of those major, you know, Cigna, Aetna, United, uh, Blue Cross, they'll all customize it for you. If you're in a self-insured plan, because you're you're not going to trip anything that's going to cause them a catastrophic uh, cost. In fact, what you'd be talking about doing would be lowering your plan risk. Uh, in that regard. If you were on a fully insured plan, so you're a smaller employer, have less employees, you do have less of, of, of um, you know, I guess, leverage on, on, your, on your vendor that your insurance cover carrier. Uh, you should ask, however, uh, because asking starts driving market demand. Uh, so if you are talking to them about, I want to make sure we're covering these therapies, covering these, these drugs, covering these things, uh, when it makes sense, um, if you're not talking to them about it, it that's how market demand happens. So um, this is a long process. Advocacy is a long process. It's going to take years to solve this problem, but that's how you can start in this. Um, so I, I appreciate the conversations and and that that question was a was a really great one to 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 end on here, uh, Doctor Miller. Thank you so much for your time and experience today. Uh, and if we have more questions as we go, I may may come back on that. But again, I, I really appreciate your thoughts and and inclusion in this. Um, and we're going to another co another poll question: Are you covering anti obesity medications today? Are you covering these today? And Rhonda, if you could kick off that poll, um, it's yes, no, not sure. Many of you may not know, and that's okay. Um, and then hopefully you'll go back and ask. Um, it's interesting. I think in some of these cases, some of these GLP ones are um, now you know proven to help heart heart issues and proven to help kidney issues. And when that kind of happens, uh, they'll be covered for those other things. They're covered for type two diabetes today. It's the same drug. Um, so we'll see more and more plans pick it up for the comorbidities. We need to get it covered for obesity, so the comorbidities don't happen. That's really what we're trying to do is get ahead of that curve. So we'll see how long, uh, it, Rhonda, when you see, when you see the, 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 the number get to a certain point, uh, let us know and we'll uh, appreciate everybody playing along at home here. So at this point, 21% of uh, the audience is in fact covering anti-obesity drugs. That's a, that's a good number to start. 33% uh, are not. So one third, absolutely not. And 46% don't know. And I get that because this is a new phenomenon. These are new medications on this on the area. And this is this is a new dialogue that we're having as part of our plans. Uh, so thank you very much for um for sharing that with us. And uh, but hopefully that this causes you to go back and and look at um what that what that means. And I'm I'm now very happy to switch our conversation to stigma, bias, and discrimination because this impacts our HR teams as much as anything. Um, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome Dr. Mary Himmelstein. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychological Services at Kent University. Her current work focuses on weight stigma, 
She explores how individuals with multiple marginalized identities experience weight stigma, and she examines how stigma influences health behavior. So, Dr. Himmelstein, thank you so much for being with us today, and uh, I look forward to this dialogue. Uh, we know that stigma is a really powerful thing. Uh, a sizable portion of this country, and hopefully not this audience anymore, is dealing with it. But talk to us about what this looks like and 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 where you see it. Yeah, thanks, George, and thanks for inviting me to be here today. As George said, stigma is a really, really powerful thing, and it's everywhere, which we'll talk about a little bit on the next slide. But let's get on the same page to make sure we all understand what we're talking about when we say stigma. When we're talking about stigma, we're talking about negative attitudes and beliefs that we have about people based on their body weight. So that can range from things like, I don't like this group of people based on um, their body weight. It can be, I believe, X, Y, or Z about this group of people based on their body weight weight, but it also encompass, encompasses stereotypes. So believing, for example, that someone is lazy, that they lack willpower, at the center of most weight stigma is really blame for that individual. And as Dr. Ward and Dr. Miller said, this is a multifaceted disease. Someone is not to blame for their body weight. And in fact, believing that actually makes us more likely to express it. And it does exactly the opposite of what you'd want it to do. We sort of have this idea that's a little bit backwards that if we just told people that, oh, you have an excess weight problem or you're overweight or you're obese, that that's going to fix the problem and suddenly motivate them to be able to change their body weight. And that's just not how it works. And in fact, it actually does exactly the opposite. When we stigmatize people for their body weight, it makes them less likely to want to eat healthy, to make it want to make someone want to exercise, for example. Yeah, and this is this is something you and I'm going to leave on this. Stay on this slide for just a second, because you're. I want to tease out that point because you and I've had this conversation uh, from a public health scenario. Uh, the the you know in the 1980s, 70s, 80s, 90s, we we addressed smoking, right? And and to get someone to quit smoking, blame and shame worked. Blame yes, and shame and not, that worked like a charm there. It's not working here. It's a completely opposite scenario that we all need to understand. So I, I'm going to ask you to underscore that one more time. Yeah, so a lot of the anti-obesity campaigns have really taken that lead from those smoking campaigns. That if we just shame people enough, suddenly they're going to be motivated to do all of the things they need to live a healthier life. And that's just not how it works with body weight. That when you stigmatize someone for their weight, it's a very stressful experience. And what we know about stress is that one of the most common ways in which people cope with stress is to eat and to tending to eat uh, high calorie, calorie dense foods. We also know that if you stigmatize someone um, they are less likely to go to the gym where potentially they feel like they don't belong, where they feel like people might be looking at them sideways. These things do exactly the opposite of encouraging people to live a healthy lifestyle. In fact, it makes them less likely to do these things. Yeah, we all know what our comfort food is. Comfort food comes in when you need to be comforted because you're feeling uncomfortable because you've been stigmatized, ostracized, devalued, rejected. All of us, you know, that's a human reaction. But I think from a HR perspective, you know, within your companies, within your health plans, understanding that's, that's how it's going to play out is an important aspect of it. And I don't think anybody on this call, hopefully, are are going so far as to do that blame and shame thing. But I understanding why it doesn't work is important. So let's just talk about, you know, the multiple levels of stigma, because I know that we, you know, that it goes uh, so much deeper. Uh, it, it's embedded in our society. So share a little bit about that. So when most people think about weight stigma, they're thinking about interpersonal stigma, this sort of middle level. We're thinking about name calling. We're thinking about um, being bullied, for instance, in school. And what we know about weight stigma is it's really everywhere. It's really, really pervasive. We see it as a structural level, and this is built into our policy practices that we have in our companies. It's built into um, not, for example, having weight in our um, bias trainings, for example. So lack of policy can also be included in structural stigma. It's also certainly embedded in the media, the way that we portray uh, characters who have higher weight on uh, TV, on in the media, in, in uh, movies. It's also built into um, 
hiring practices, all of these things would encompass that structural stigma. Interpersonal stigma is going to be exactly what we said before. So bullying, weight-based victimization. This is going to be, again, what most people think about when they think about weight stigma. And then there's also interpersonal stigma, which are intrapersonal stigma, which is coming from the self. When I think about interpersonal, I think about between persons. I think about I'm calling someone a name. When I think about intra, I think about within the self. So this happens when people believe stereotypes about obesity and they apply them to themselves. So I think that people who have high body weight are lazy and I'm high body weight and thus I think I am lazy. And you start to devalue yourself because of your body weight. That's known as intrapersonal stereotyping or intrapersonal stigma. And this is um, sometimes referred to as weight bias internalization, has exactly the same effects as you see from interpersonal stigma. These are really centered um, in terms of belonging. So if you think about the way that your office space is laid out, do you have seating options for people who have higher body weight? That could be encompassed in that structural stigma as well. You're communicating to people when you don't have effective seating, um, effective areas for navigation, that they don't belong in those spaces. And that's also going to fall under this umbrella as well. Yeah, that's a good point. And hopefully the audience is listening to it. What is your, are all your chairs uh, meant for somebody who it's like a Southwest airline seat on that Southwest is fine. But you, you know, people can't, not all body types can fit in. Uh, so, but, and this can lead to actual physical ramifications. So, you know, let's share, share some more bad news. Yeah, so my own work and that of a lot of my colleagues has shown that when you experience weight stigma, it is a physically stressful experience. You see blood pressure spikes, you see heart rate spikes, you see um, an increase in a stress hormone called cortisol when you experience weight stigma from any of these levels that we've just talked about. And this turns into physical issues. This not only causes mental health issues like psychological problems, uh, for example, depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, feeling bad about your own body, but that then leads to physical health problems. So it's not just about addressing mental health, it's also addressing those things that are going to become physical health problems. We know that um, weight stigma is directly tied to um, things like increases in, again, the hormone cortisol, that it's tied to problems problems with A1C that, again, are going to complicate things like type 2 diabetes. We know that it's really strongly tied to health behaviors and not in the way that you'd expect. So we said, when you shame someone, it doesn't make them, you know, super motivated to go to the gym. In fact, it does exactly the opposite. They don't want to necessarily go to the gym because it's likely a space where they've been stigmatized previously. Um, something that we didn't touch on before that I'm going to mention, there's sort of this misconception that people who have higher body weight just don't know that they have higher body weight. And that's not the case. Most people who struggle with high weight are aware of it and have probably tried many, many times to lose weight um, on fad diets, for instance, which actually contributes to problems in your uh, metabolic health, right? So going up and down is not great either. But it's not that people don't know what to do. It's that essentially we've made it really, really hard in our environment for people to be able to eat healthy and get enough movement. And that's a cultural problem. It's an environmental problem. It's not just calories in, calories out for people. And in addition, we haven't given them access to the treatments that really do work when by combining lifestyle management, anti-obesity medications, and in, in, in hopefully the extraordinarily circumstance bariatric surgery, but giving them access to the treatments that actually do work. And and back to your point on the intra intrapersonal and and we all know people who uh, I don't you know I'm that you you internalize all the bad things you've heard and then you don't feel worthy. You don't feel exactly. Worthy, and that's not helpful. Exactly, and it, that becomes sort of a vicious cycle, right? You you start thinking I can't do this. I'm not. It's not going to matter. And so why should I even try? Essentially. Great. Uh, well, let's talk about workplace, examples of workplace bias and uh, weight bias. So, so walk us through a little bit of that. This is an HR team watching. Yep. So we know that um, higher, people with higher body weight are less likely to be hired. We know this from experimental um, 
data within the lab. So giving people two identical resumes, showing them a picture of a higher weight and a lower weight individual, the lower weight individual is more likely to be hired. But we also know this from real world data with uh, or through HR essentially that you're less likely to be hired if you have high body weight. We know that when people do get hired, they tend to be hired at a lower wage. So you'll see um, the suggested salary in those experimental paradigms when you're higher body weight, that salary tends to be lower. And again, we see that in real world data as well. There's a stat that I want to point out here on this slide that a woman with obesity who has a bachelor's degree is making about 12% less than a, an equivalent woman who has a normal quote unquote BMI. Uh, we also know that because of stereotyping that wages get impacted by things like um, that laziness stereotype. So we tend to see higher weight employees as lacking discipline. And so then when we're recommending them for promotions, we're less likely to do that. Uh, weight's, weight has been implicated in wrongful termination and um, it is legal in most states to um, discriminate against someone based on their body weight. There are very few um, places where that is illegal. And again, that gets to that structural level of stigma. In terms of um, negative stereotyping, that's going to contribute to people being less likely to be promoted, again, to be um, to be presented into programs where they might um, be able to be promoted. And we also know that individuals who have high body weight are less likely to be put in front facing jobs. So they're less likely to be chosen to be the, the receptionist, for instance, or to be the person who's meeting with clients. Um, and that has to do with that stereotyping as well. Sure, sure. Um, so how can we reduce it? What can we do to uh... To, to, to limit this and, and, and move that stigma and, and knock it down a little bit. So the first step in reducing bias is to recognize our own potential biases. So for example, we have all been raised in this obesogenic environment, in this stigma prone environment. And so everybody has some form of weight bias. And so really being honest with yourself and looking at how do you think about someone when you see someone who's higher body weight, maybe how you think about yourself if you're higher body weight. Start there. And I think that's the most important step is to begin to recognize it. When you recognize your own biases, it makes it then easier to um, to start to change those. Remember that people who have high body weight have been really frequent targets of stigma. And again, most of them have tried to lose weight in the past, often unsuccessfully. That's going to contribute to that internalized or self-stereotyping, which then makes it less likely that they're going to want to continue to try. Uh, we know that um, Having a clear system for reporting bullying and making sure that there is a zero tolerance policy in place in your workplace practices is really, really important. Uh, making sure that um, just like we wouldn't tolerate any kind of gender or racial discrimination, that we also won't tolerate discrimination based on weight would be really important. Um, a really simple thing that most workplaces can do, you have to do bias training in most states. So a way that you can incorporate weight bias into those is to include body weight when you're doing things like sexual harassment training, when you're doing things like race and gender based trainings for bias, include weight in those categories and make it clear that you value employees of all body sizes. So again, including those in your anti-bullying policies in your um, harassment training, for example. Also making sure that your hiring practice practices are equitable for people of a variety of body sizes, talking to people about weight discrimination, acknowledging that this is likely happening in your company, and making sure that you've put policies into place to prevent it. All of these are just really important steps that, again, it's not in your mindset. If as an HR professional, uh, you, you're not thinking about this, you are thinking about discrimination, you are thinking about these those other areas, please include weight in the framing of all of the, in the context of all of that. Um, even if it's not illegal, it's not the right thing to do. This is the right thing to do. This thing's on this on this slide. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and you know, let's move on to workplace wellness. Workplace wellness is really popular and everybody's, it, this, is, this, is, this is all really, really good stuff, but it can, it can go wrong. You know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. It can go wrong. So share a little bit about the right and the wrongs of this and how to get this right. So we've talked a lot about weight in this presentation. And so you might think the very first thing to do is, oh, well, we should have a weight loss competition. Don't do that. That's actually not doing uh, what, what you'd want it to do. And in fact, it's going to do the opposite. It can encourage disordered eating behavior. So you don't want to have a weight loss competition. So if you want to encourage um, 
your employees to be healthy, to eat a nutritious lunch, to get their movement in every day, um, to change shopping habits, for instance, you need to reward it. And you can do that through wellness initiatives. So for example, you could provide a monetary reward for people who are getting their yearly physical, who are getting their flu shot, who are going to the gym a couple of times a week. And you can have um, a, a gym membership built into your um, benefit package, for instance, even if you can't do a full membership partnering with a gym for a discount, um, having lunch and learns where you talk about what does a nutritious lunch look like and uh, sharing different recipes for nutritious lunches. Again, weight loss competitions are not going to be the way to go, um, even though that tends to be a popular way that people uh, will deal with that. That's going to encourage the opposite of what you want. It's going to encourage disordered eating behavior. Other things that you can do is to focus on health markers. So for example, if you want to lower people's blood pressure, focus on health behaviors that are going to lower blood pressure. Encourage people to get the recommended amount of exercise. Have time or places in your workplace where people can get up and walk around so that they have those at least five minutes of walking every hour. Um, recognizing that wellness programs need to be fairly diverse because one single program is not going to work for every single employee that you have. Focusing on education about what a regular portion size looks like. Think about when you go out to a restaurant. Oftentimes you're getting a plate full of food that is sometimes three to four times the recommended serving size. So sometimes people can be divorced from essentially what an actual serving size should look like. And as simple as having a lunch and learn program where you show them, here's what your lunch plate should look like for a good and nutritious meal can be helpful as well. Yeah, and that's that's a great point as well. Um, and you know, so how many of us have lunch and learn programs? And it's a small lunch now, but it's the right lunch. Uh, but uh, you have it going through that process. If you somebody had earlier answered, you know, I, I can't get anybody to cover nutritional counseling. Bring it to yourself. Bring it in. It's that it's it's that is so inexpensive. Uh, but it's important. Um, and I, you know, and, you know, we all have our employee of the month that their, their parking spot should be in the back of the parking lot. Uh, you know, that should be their reward. They get an extra walk unless it's raining. Maybe they give them two spots, but um, there's a lot to really to think about here. And I really appreciate this. We've had a couple of questions in here as we're wrapping. One was, you know, how likely is it for somebody who is uh, a, a high body weight person to actually report harassment? and bullying. Yeah, I, I... So, so I'll tackle this. Um, about 44% of people who have high weight report that they have experienced weight stigma. And most of the time it's coming actually from healthcare providers and from family members, but a, a significant proportion also report it in the workplace. Um, in terms of whether or not they're taken seriously, this is true for most kind of bias. When you have the person who's the target coming up to say, this has happened to me, we tend to unfortunately not take that person seriously. Um, we tend to say, oh, well, you know, that person was just joking around um, and it should be taken seriously every single time that someone reports that. One of the things that you can do to um, encourage people to to be inclusive and to not be stigmatizing is to call people in to recognize, hey, you know, we don't need to have that kind of um, interaction here and to spot it when you see it, say something when you see it, as opposed to relying on the person who's been the target of harassment to be the reporter. Yeah, that is perfect. And we are now at the top of the hour. So I'm going to cut the conversation off here, but it, there's great comments here. And, and Dr. Himmelstein, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your, your insight to this conversation. I really, really appreciate it. I really appreciate the audience for your time today in, uh, in presenting here and, and, and watching this program. Hopefully you found this valuable. Uh, the slides are available through hr.com. I also wanted to point out a white paper that um, the Diabetes Leadership Council supported the, the development of. And Dr. Miller was uh, one of the lead authors, authors on this paper. It was just reported in the American Journal of Managed Care this, this week. So it's fresh off the press, uh, talking about the overall obesity uh, crisis in America and, and the things that need to happen, many of which we've touched on today. Um, hopefully you can you can understand that it, you know if we're not gonna solve this this problem, this healthcare crisis, without the employer being involved. Uh, if the employer doesn't step up and be involved in this, we're not going to get where we need to be. Uh, we do now have medications and treatments that are effective. 
uh, we have to work together to get those treatments and make those treatments available to the working age adults, the adult population that need it. Um, we have the opportunity to have this, this country look different 20 years from now, 30 years from now, a generation from now, but we have to start today to make that happen. So I really appreciate everybody's uh, time and interest in being on this on this uh, webinar. Hope you've got something uh, meaningful from it. And uh, please, if you if you have questions, uh, you know, for us, uh, please don't hesitate to shoot us a note at employers at diabetesleadership.org and hit the diabetesleadership.org website for employer solutions where we talk about plan design issues on chronic disease management in addition to obesity. Uh, so with that, I, I really do appreciate your time. And um, Rhonda, if there's any uh, follow-up that you've got uh, for the audience, that would be great. Absolutely. Uh, most importantly, my follow-up is an echo. Thank you so very much uh, to yourself, George, for moderating and then all three of your presenters. Uh, this was absolutely excellent. You can see in the chat. Thank you, everyone, for participating, for engagement, and for learning with us. Uh, if you would like to view it again, if you have come late or you'd just like to view it again, it will be archived shortly on hr.com, so you can view it again at any time. Uh, your HRCI and your SHRM credit, those will be in your hr.com account within two business days, we will send you an email with your credit information. And when I close out the session uh, very shortly here, an exit survey will open on your computer. So it's very important to us and to the folks at Diabetes Leadership Council that you just take a few moments to fill out that exit survey. And again, we thank everyone and take great care for now. Thank you all.